We are going to now try and understand how to use quantitative methods in our research. I think this is a very important part of research and therefore it is essential that we completely understand how exactly we should be applying these quantitative methods. What is our own thinking that goes into it? How do we choose quantitative versus qualitative and so on? Basically what does quantitative methodology involve? It is a systematic empirical investigation of whatever phenomenon that you are studying as part of your research using computational, mathematical, statistical techniques. That is really what we are going to do. Very often people are not very comfortable with so much of quantitative content. They feel a little afraid of all the numbers. But first of all, one must get rid of this bias. You must understand that research can be very beautiful. It can be like any art of creation. So when you enjoy cooking, how good it is for you, you plan your ingredients, you plan the process, you plan how much time everything is going to take, isn't it? Similarly, when a composer is creating something new, maybe a piece of music or a piece of art, he thinks of the entire thing together. He doesn't think of the words separately and the music notes separately, the composition separately. So for research, everything must come together. One must think like you're creating something very beautiful, very aesthetic. You are maybe like I said, either cooking or completing a jigsaw. So you're putting all the pieces separately together. So that really is according to me what research is and what quantitative methodology is. Research designing is very, very important in this process and that's exactly what I meant that in this process you must have a very parsimonious, a very neat and well planned research design for which you need to pre-think many of the things that you actually want to look at later when you do your statistical analysis. There are a lot of jokes about how statistics conceals a great many things and reveals a great many things. And very often what it conceals is even more interesting than what it reveals. But that shouldn't happen. We should actually be able to be very transparent with our research findings and what exactly it is that we are trying to convey in our findings. In the first part of this discussion that we are going to have, we are going to really distinguish very clearly between quantitative methodology, qualitative methodology and what we call mixed methodology. And then the focus of my presentation is going to be on the first of these three that is quantitative methodology. So what we need to look at is what is our sources of knowledge, what is our sources of information, what are we basing our observations on. These and others are going to be our concerns when we zero in on a quantitative method in order to do our research. So basically when you begin to think of your research, think of it in all these creative ways, think of it as a journey that you're going to essay and you're going to set out, look for something very interesting and then plan how best to present it to your audience exactly as you would if you went on a journey. That is what we are now going to you know, go forward into and when we do research, we have to actually plan what is the area that we want to research. So we have to decide on a methodology which is suitable to that area. Then we also have to plan a very neat and a very economical research design. Why do I say neat and economical? Because we don't want to waste any of the precious resources we have, whether they be monetary resources, time resources or personnel. We want to use them to our best of our capacity in order to create a good research design. So research methodology, research design is what we need to choose. And after that, we have to actually plan the analysis in quantitative methodology, we want to look at, am I going to do an experimental study? Am I going to do a survey? If I'm going to venture out into qualitative methodology, again, I have to choose which specific method I'm going to use. And a lot of researchers choose for, go for mixed methods. Again, just saying I'm going to do mixed methods is not enough. One has to decide which part of your study is going to be quantitative, which is going to be qualitative. So a mixed method study can begin with a quantitative approach and move on to a qualitative approach for an in-depth analysis of what all your results actually are showing you. As I mentioned earlier, for this, we have to look at some very, very important components of research. One of them is ontology. One of them is epistemology. And these are two very important components. We shall now look at them. 
As I mentioned, when we study ontology, we are really examining what is the nature of my reality. That is what is meant by an ontological question. When you answer an epistemological question, you are trying to answer, how is it that I know what I know? What method do I use to find out what I know? So let us take two quick examples. For an ontological research that is based in a kind of third person, distanced, very objective observation, the nature of my reality is what I am watching. All right? So I could be watching a patient who is let us say in a lot of pain or I may be watching a child who is trying to learn a new subject or I may be watching a scientist who is trying to discover something new, make some experiment. So my nature of my reality which I am looking at is what I can see merely. right? So epistemologically what I know and how I know it will depend on this observation which will necessarily be very objective, very third person, very distanced from the phenomenon that I am trying to study. If on the other hand I want an insider perspective, so if on the other hand I want to understand this person in pain, how is he feeling? What does it feel like to have that pain? Or a scientist, what sort of curiosity do you feel inside your mind when you can feel that you are on the threshold of a new discovery? This is an insider perspective and we are going to look at these two perspectives very carefully. So this is your ontological question and your epistemological question. And then finally of course you have your research method which you choose which will be based on both of these. So if it's, if it's the first, the kind of examples I gave you first, like a third person perspective, you are very very likely to use a more quantitative methodology and if it's more of an insider perspective then it's highly likely that you will choose a qualitative methodology. As Thomas Kuhn said, what is your paradigm? What is in your mind this entire set of concepts which are driving your research? So I have put a small quotation by Kuhn for you to understand and from this will flow your entire research process. So what do you see on the slide where I have tried to portray the research process? You will actually see how you start with a research question, then you go about a certain pathway where you decide how am I going to collect my data. So what is my reality? How do I know what I know? The ontology and the epistemology. And then I decide what will be the sources of my data. So if it is quantitative data, I will probably have surveys, I will have questionnaires, I will have rating scales. If it is more qualitative data, I would probably have focus groups, I would have you know, discussions, interviews, personal questions and answers. Again in that I will decide my methodologies. So I may use a narrative methodology or any other approach that is available to me in qualitative research. So as Kuhn said, for your methodological planning, you have to have this entire paradigm in your mind. Now friends, I am going to take you through a slightly busy slide which I borrowed from a very reliable source that is an author called Cresswell who has written on research methods. Here we are trying to contrast three different approaches to research. The quantitative approach which is what we are focusing on today, the qualitative approach and the mixed methods approach. Let us very quickly look at this slide and try and understand what are the key differences between these three approaches. In the example I gave you earlier, as you will see in the quantitative approach, you have a very, very objective third person kind of approach and so you have predetermined methods. Let us look at these three methods one by one. In the quantitative methods approach, you generally have a predetermined instrument or set of instruments which you are planning to use. These could be standardized tests, they could be tools such as survey questionnaires or rating scales, anything like that which is pre-planned, which you have piloted, where you have standardization data on that tool. So it's a very set procedure that you have. After you have collected all this data, which you generally do as I said like a third person, you don't go too deep into the entire phenomenon, you merely enter your field, collect your data and move out. 
and then generally you have a very statistical computational methodology to crunch this data to try and analyze what that data what those measures those numbers are actually showing you and so the conclusions that you will draw will go along the lines of statistics they will be based on confidence intervals on hypothesis testing regions of rejection which typically you choose your critical area of the normal curve beforehand so that is for you in a nutshell the quantitative approach the qualitative approach is completely different in a qualitative approach you start bottom up right so in a quantitative approach you are starting with theory you are starting with a certain bit of known information known tools instruments qualitative approaches on the other hand are used more to explore so you get into the phenomenon without necessarily having ready made tools and instruments which you are going to measure and your methods emerge as you discover more and more about the field so you have a lot of flexibility to decide what exactly am i going to do am i going to do a group interview or an individual interview how am i going to approach looking for this particular data in a qualitative approach i can also change direction midway so if i find some really very interesting phenomenon as an action researcher i can move a little bit decide to go deeper into that phenomenon explore it further so to make a direct contrast your search methodologies the tools with which you use are not necessarily set in stone in a qualitative research paradigm so naturally your analysis will also change so in qualitative paradigms you are going to have more of textual analysis more of analyzing narratives trying to find out themes trying to find out commonalities a lot of verbal data a lot of non numerical data can also be looked at in this context so it's a very interesting approach in mixed methods you have a little of both but it's not as if you're just very casually mixing the two for that also you have to have a plan so if you plan to begin with a quantitative approach then you can segue into a qualitative approach and say fine i have my major statistical findings now i will go into depth and i will try and find out what each of these participants think maybe to take some first person accounts do some interviews in qualitative research i can also support my research with maybe something like a video taped interview or a diary entry of the participant and so on so it can be very thick rich data as they call it whereas quantitative data is not necessarily so deep but it is very wide so to sum it up in quantitative methods you have a wide reach large sample sizes quantitative methodologies for analysis in qualitative data you have not such a wide reach but depth and so you're going deeper into the phenomenon and trying to understand it better so obviously your methodology will be based on the kind of research question you have and mixed method approaches which are now getting more and more popular have to be well planned in terms of whether quantity is major quality is minor or vice versa which is first which is later how exactly you plan to analyze all this mass of data that you find first of all let us look at a very popular quantitative research methods which many many sciences social sciences languages various fields use quite a lot and this method is the survey method in a survey method what you're interested in going is in going out to a large sample and collecting many many responses for a certain domain that you wish to research so naturally surveys can be very cheap because you don't have to expend a lot of money a lot of time or a lot of manpower personnel to try and collect all this data so you can throw out a large survey questionnaire and collect thousands of data points in return so it can be quite parsimonious quite cheap it can be quite easy quick easy to accomplish it's not a very long plodding process going and collecting all this data so it can be quite effective surveys can be a very effective method of conducting a quantitative research and quickly gathering a large mass of data so in sciences or in fields where a quick turnaround is required you want to know very fast what are the kind of trends that you're seeing so maybe in fields like marketing or you know where you very quickly want to see results surveys are a very effective methodology what do you think are likely to be the flip side the negatives obviously people may not be completely honest how many times sometimes we only just give very casual answers to a survey because we don't have time 
So it's possible that people may give very throwaway answers. People may not answer very honestly. A lot of people may just refuse to answer the survey. So a natural bias may come into your sample, right? You might have people who are ready to answer, who have lots of time on their hands, as against people who are not so ready to answer, who are not so willing. So survey methodologies have a lot of advantages like quick access, quick turnaround, ease of data collection, less of cost and so on. But they do have their own difficulties. So that is the strengths and the weaknesses of survey methodology for you. Do remember that in today's day and age, we have so many media through which you can conduct surveys. So it is those old times are gone when a surveyor would have to knock on each door and go and ask questions. You still have that happening for censuses, etc. But you can have surveys today which are oral like I just described face to face. You can also have telephonic surveys. You can have online surveys which are done through the computer, through email, through large groups. Today you have a lot of surveys even conducted on social media. Very quickly on an app a person might be able to respond and you can get a percentage of the kind of people who are responding yes or no. You can also have telephone surveys. We have very often somebody calling you up and asking you certain questions. So these are the various means and the ways with which you can conduct a survey and find out what are the broad trends which are generally seen. Quantitative research can be of various sorts. It can be descriptive. So what you're trying to do in that is just talk about what sort of descriptors best outline the kind of data that you have in terms of central tendency, variability and so on. They can also be correlational and quantitative findings can also be causal comparative. In causal comparative designs where you're trying to trying to derive a sort of cause effect relationship from the kind of data that you get, there is a wide variety that you get. And there can be many, many kinds of what we call experimental designs, which are very, very robust. They can also be what are called pre-experimental designs. Let us look at some of those first. Even a single case study, in a sense, is a pre-experimental design. What are you doing in a single case study? You are trying to find out a baseline, trying to measure a baseline, then try and introduce some kind of an intervention, some kind of an experimental intervention or some change or some method which is introduced. And then after that process, you are trying to find out what is the outcome. So you can have a single case this study, you can have a pre post own control kind of design. And in this pre post own control kind of design, you can also have a small number of subjects also. So this is a typical pre-experimental design that you can have. You can also have a one-shot intervention where you are merely in bringing in that intervention or that treatment just that one time. Similarly, you can also have a time series. So you can also have the same intervention or a variation of that intervention, a variation of that treatment brought in at specific time intervals and each time an analysis is done to see what has been the impact of this treatment that was given to the subjects. So these are some of the pre-experimental designs that we have available to us. Let us look at a few more. So we have looked at one group designs, we have looked at single case designs. Sometimes you have a static group comparison where it is not as if you are bringing in a lot of intervention or treatment on your own that you typically do in a true experimental design. So you have full control over that experimental manipulation, but you are merely looking at a naturally occurring event that has happened to one group and not happened to another group. For example, to take a very simple example, suppose you're looking at the impact of some disaster, maybe a tsunami or you know, an, a cyclone or something else that happened and you're looking at two geographical areas, one which has been far away from the site of the disaster and one which has been actually at the epicenter. So here you have two static groups and you're look, really looking at the impact of that particular event on these groups. Now these are really not true experimental designs which are far more robust and far more experimentally sound. Let us look at some of those. What do you do in a true experimental design? What you try to do is first of all you sample very carefully as far as possible randomly. Of course as we have discussed many times earlier random sampling is not as easy as it sounds. Systematically any random sample every subject should have an equal chance of entering that particular sample. 
So if you manage stratified random or systematic random sampling excellent. So what you can do is send these subjects to the two groups after randomly selecting them to ensure that there is no bias. And then you can bring an experimental condition into play into one of those groups and ensure that the other group does not get that experimental condition. So in effect what you have is an E group or an experimental group and a C group that is a control group. Now you are very well placed to actually compare these groups both pre and post if you like or if you have matched those groups to start with then you can compare the outcomes and you can therefore try that is why we called it the causal comparative design. We can actually try to conclude based on this what could be the cause of a certain possible effect in that particular experimental group. In these two experimental designs you can have a wide variety. You can have a pre-test, post-test experimental group, you know, where you are trying to introduce equivalence at these groups at the pre-test, like I gave the example earlier of matching. And then you introduce a certain experimental variable and see the groups, see the changes that occur in the experimental group. An even more elegant kind of design is a Solomon 3 group or a Solomon 4 group design in which you are introducing and you have a very neat slide on this which I would like you to see where you are trying to see how at each level of the intervention there are measures being taken pre-test measures and post-test measures. Sometimes you can also have very elegant designs from which you can draw a lot of factorial analysis out of. So you can actually divide various conditions and make sure that there is a mixing and matching between the condition and the time at which it occurs. So you have order effects controlled for and then you can very confidently say that it is not order effects, it is not practice of fatigue but it is actually my experimental variable that has brought about these specific changes. Let us see some of these designs, I have tried to present them to you in a sort of diagrammatic form. The example I just mentioned to you was like a Latin square design. So Latin squares or Greco-Latin square designs can very neatly be put into a factorial analysis later. So we are going to look at some examples of factorial designs as well. What we have really understood through all this is that in the true experimental designs, you need to have a very rigorous control on the experiment, on the number of subjects present in the design, whether they are equal ends in each group, all these kind of things have to be very rigorously managed in order to have a successful experimental design. Let us look some at some examples diagrammatically or figurally to try and see how these subjects can be distributed. A very nice way, a very um, parsimonious way in which to do this kind of design is to use a factorial design. What do you do in this? What you try to do is suppose you are taking two variables. Each of those variables are present at say two levels each, high and low. What you try to do in such a design is that you completely cross these factors with each other. So as you see on the slide, you have four different combinations. You have one in which both the variables are high one in which both the variables are low, one in which the first variable is high, the second is low and one which the second variable is high and the first is low. Now you have four clean, well divided, separated kind of conditions which you are comparing with each other and you are going to measure a number of dVs and try and see how those dVs, those dependent variables pan out. Why is this called an omnibus hypothesis? For the simple reason that you are testing multiple hypotheses at the same time without compromising on error. So you are not building up or multiplying your error or your margin of error because you are testing all hypotheses at once which is why this is a very neat and parsimonious kind of design. Let us look at one example where you have a total of about 132 sample size. A number of subjects in your study are 132. Now let us imagine that we are breaking up these various subjects into a number of categories. One, we are dividing them up into genders, so male versus female. A second, we are using two different experimental interventions. So for one experimental intervention, those same 132 patients. So first of all, we have divided up that total sample size of 132 into 66 males and 66 female subjects. So now we are poised to be able to compare them along gender lines if we wish to. 
Then suppose I have another intervention where there are three different levels, then what I do is I break those same 132 subjects into three different groups of 44 each. I have to make sure however that out of each of those 44, 22 are men and 22 are women. So my gender distribution is looked after that is not vitiated and I am still having my second variable at three different levels and so on. So as the figure showed you in the, in the slide, you can have a two-way analysis of variance or a three-way analysis of variance. So you can even have three different variables, each at two levels or three levels each. So what you get is a design like a three into two into two or a two into two into two design. Sometimes one does not have the luxury of so much experimental control and we have to make do with what we call quasi-experimental designs. However, this is a very practical way to go about. Sometimes quasi-experimental designs may not be as robust, may not be as like we said gold standard, but they are quite practical. What do we do here? We can take conditions where there is not perfect matching of subjects. We can take a stand, a very research based stand of which are the relevant variables that really require matching because matching is a very difficult uh, criterion to achieve in any particular sample. You can also run simulations, you can manage to have some kind of an archived variable, you can have proxy variables. So you might have certain data which is already available where the, in the archives that the data or the demographic distributions or the ages etc are available to you. And in that quasi experimental design you feed those into your data sheet and you utilize them to the best possible use. And then of course, as we discussed earlier, we can have only post test only designs. So you take the group as is in the environment, you do not really sample or pick groups as per your choice, you take them as they occur. So for example, if you are comparing two different schools or if you are comparing an urban and a rural residency, you just take them as they are and you assume that that significant variable that you are looking at is actually making a causative impact on the variable that you are comparing. Let us not stop here and start thinking that we only have causal comparative research to assay. No, no, we have a lot more that we can do. In fact, some very interesting designs that give us very, very meaningful data can be time series. You might see the impact of a certain variable in society or in education or in any particular field of our interest, even health, social factors and see from time to time how changes are occurring. Very interestingly, this can happen even with archived data, it can even happen with literature. For example, if you are studying editorials in a newspaper over a particular period of time, you will instantly see trends as they occur over a time series. So in a time series, you can have repeated measurements being taken. So in today's day and age also, time series designs are very valuable because if you have a trend time changes trend that has happened over the existing data, you can use it to forecast, you can use it to predict and to understand what trends are likely to be. Another very important kind of design that you can use is a correlational design where you are looking at relationships between variables. So you might have a positive relationship where both variables rise and fall together. Or you might have an inverse relationship, for example, the cheaper certain objects are the more they might sell. So cost versus the popularity of the product can actually be an inverse relationship. So correlational data, time series data are all very valuable. So we are not at all thinking that quantitative methodology is only causal comparative, there is a large variety that we can use all within the quantitative paradigm. Let us just do a quick summary of what we have so far. What we have really understood is that very, very importantly in any kind of experimental design, the, the gold standard is to be able to control, to be able to manipulate, to be able to know that you have titrated the exact value of the experimental variable so that whatever dependent variable changes that you see are the result or the outcome of this particular variable. You also looked at the importance of sampling and how it is important to have accurately done sampling techniques without any bias or any other kind of disturbance which will affect your final results. We have seen so far the importance of control, manipulation, so we have seen how difficult it is sometimes to achieve but it has to be done. 
the importance of replication being able to conduct a certain experiment once more to be able to establish that these are really true findings and that way we can establish that our science is very valid and strong. We have also seen how we can manipulate experimental groups, we can manipulate the independent variable and see its impact on the dependent variable. We have seen how important control variables are because we cannot allow these other biases to enter into our findings. More importantly, we have also looked at sampling and how sampling strategies which are wrongly done, biased samples can actually vitiate your actual experimental findings. We have looked at the importance of pre-test and post-test. So, for the same group, we can see how that experimental variable actually brought about a change in the same subjects. We have also seen how we can use two independent groups and compare them along certain parameters. Most importantly, we have also seen how to use omnibus hypotheses, use the same subjects very, very parsimoniously and effectively wasting any kind of data. Finally, I will emphasize one important point. Any kind of research we do, we are very focused on its generalizability. I may well conduct a very, very neat experiment in my laboratory, but how generalizable is it in the outside world? So, generalizability will depend on a lot of factors which we have to control as researchers. So, are there a factors such as maturation? Have my subjects changed in some way over time? Are there factors such as practice and fatigue? Have my subjects, experimental subjects actually had exposure to the task for too long and so they are fatigued or they have built up practice and so they are getting better and better at this kind of task. So all these are important factors which I really must look at. What I must also look at is my bias, my personal experimenter bias or a subject bias. So very important in experimental designs is to have a single blind or a double blind study. So, a single blind study is one where the subject bias is removed because the subject does not know which group he or she is in and a double blind is where the experiment also is not aware. So, you have coded groups and finally only after you decode do you know which particular experimental or control group that subject belonged to. So, handling through controls all these factors of maturation, of testing effects also, of practice, of fatigue, all these different factors will matter. And then finally, you are in a position to decide how generalizable are my findings. When I initially sample, I must always keep an eye on my total sample size. Because if I start, for example, I give you that sample example of 132 subjects. Now, in that study, I cannot start with 132 subjects because what if there is attrition? What if some subjects drop out along the way of the study or some do not consent to participate in the study? Ethical issues are very important and we must take participant consent. So, always account for attrition. And having done all this, then we are in a position to say, fine, I have a relatively foolproof kind of study, a relatively watertight kind of study where I can comfortably draw generalizations based on my findings. Then of course, back again, we are a full circle to our concepts of cause and effect. In social science, can I confidently say that X caused Y or was it just a contributory factor? We are back again to our whole debate on ontology, epistemology and all these debates are never ending. And so I think finally it is up to each researcher to very carefully and with a lot of wisdom and patience think through all these factors until they arrive at a satisfactory design which will take them to, through to the next stage of research. So finally friends options are many. We have to make a reasoned choice and having had this decision that is rested on our shoulders is really what makes research very satisfying. Thank you.